Our reading this morning is called For My Sister Emigrating, and it's by Wendy Cope. You've left me with things you couldn't take or bear to give away, books and records, and a biscuit tin that Nana gave you. It's old and dirty, and the lid won't fit. Standing in a corner of my room, it's quite useless. It's as touching as a once-loved toy. Yes, sentimental now, but if you'd stayed, we would have quarreled just the same as ever, found excuses not to phone. We never learn. We've grown up struggling, frightened in the family that would drown us, only giving in to love when someone's gone or dead. The young man walked into the room. He was tired in body and spirit. He'd taken a five-hour flight and a long cab ride to get to the nursing home in Golden, Colorado. His mother had called the day before to tell him that his grandmother had stopped eating and drinking a few days earlier when she realized that she was never going to go home. She was never going to leave the nursing home again. The young man had come to say goodbye. When he went over to her bed, she didn't talk or move. As he leaned in to kiss her, she slowly turned away from him onto her side, and she faced the wall. She was a very private and proud person, and she was dying. He had come to say goodbye to a woman who had been a difficult and sometimes an unkind grandmother. He felt she hadn't been a very good mother to his mother. And yet, she'd given him important gifts. She'd shared her memories of the father that he had lost when he was young. She had helped him in high school when he'd gotten into some real trouble. She shared her deep love of nature and birds. So he had wanted to come and say thank you and goodbye. He spent 24 hours with her. He had pictures of their family and of her second husband, Alan, to share. And she looked at those. And when she did, she smiled with her eyes. Yes. He told her that Alan was coming in four days. Maybe she could hold on until then. She took a little bit of food after that. He said thank you over and over again for her gifts. Yes. And then it was time to catch the plane. After a hug and some kisses on her forehead, telling her he had to leave now, he walked towards the door. He turned around and said, goodbye, Grandma. I love you. And then she spoke in words he could understand for the first time since he'd arrived. She said, don't go. It had never been easy with his grandmother. All of our important goodbyes are long. This goodbye wasn't done. In fact, it had just started. Some of our goodbyes that are important are long on the front end before the separation, or they're long on the back end after the departure. You. And I, you the congregation, and I the acting minister slash intern minister, also have our own goodbyes that we'll be saying over the next six or eight weeks. That time may seem to be an eternity for some of you. And for others of you, it may be a blink in the eye, a blink of the eye. But we will be practicing our own goodbyes over the next month and a half. Saying goodbye is something that we actually do all the time. But as in the case of the young man and his grandmother, some goodbyes are harder than others. Yeah. When someone close is moving away, maybe our child as she moves out to her own apartment or off to school in another city, or when someone moves in, maybe an older parent who now needs help, and we have to say goodbye to our independence 
and perhaps hello again to a conflicted relationship. When we leave a job, someone we love dies. And of course, when we die ourselves, all of these are significant goodbyes. And the significant goodbyes are complex. For example, when I say goodbye to my daughter heading off to college, I'm also saying goodbye to my role as a parent or, parent or a guardian, perhaps not completely, but in part. I'm saying goodbye to the old relationship because it will invariably be changed by her new independence. And I'm saying goodbye to part of my identity, my sense of who I am, and that's often the toughest. Goodbye, it's a complicated process, and it's often a slow process. As a process, of course, there's, there's no right or wrong or final ending for goodbyes, but we know when we're crossing over into the area of a good goodbye, of a completed goodbye, by how we feel. If you think back on a goodbye in your life that was good, You'll remember at that, at, that, at that point, at some point in that goodbye, perhaps you still felt sadness. And you may have felt freer, or finally filled with some inward quickening toward what was to come, or some peace. The highly respected church consultant, Roy Oswald, who writes a lot about ministerial terminations, wrote it this way. He said, there's a resurrection side of goodbyes when we face our fears and our anxieties with candor and honesty and hang in there with the uncomfortable feelings. It always seems to come out on the other end as a more wholesome, life-giving experience. Amen. Then we feel affirmed in our humanity, and there's a freshness and a meaning to life that we hadn't experienced before. We each have our own pattern of saying goodbye, too. It's helpful to know that pattern. Now think about the last party you went to, the last social gathering. Maybe it was a reception or dinner at a friend's house. Think back on it. And how did you leave? Did you say goodbye to whomever you'd been talking with? Or did you find the hosts, if it was a larger party, and thank them and say goodbye? Did you find a way to say goodbye to the whole group? Yeah. Or did you just slip away? Whatever process you last used to leave a social gathering is probably the one that is your pattern. You can change it, but changing it takes intentionality and commitment. Another thing about goodbyes is that Although goodbyes are highly individual and so related to who the two people are or what the situation is, but good goodbyes include some of the same basic components that what folks call good deaths include. John Fletcher, a minister who works for the Alban Institute, wrote that there are four basic components to a good death. And these, he says, are also major pieces in a goodbye that lets you truly move into the next phase of your life. Those four pieces of goodbye are naming and taking some kind of control of the situation, taking care of any practical affairs that make sense given the new situation, letting go of our grudges and our pain and this is the hardest part. And then saying thank you. The fourth block is showing appreciation and gratitude where you feel it. Now, when we have the gift of time, when we can do this goodbye work with people who are leaving or leaving us, we can do it in person. I watched someone I loved say goodbye in a very intentional way and I learned so much from that experience. When my mother's breast cancer returned in 2001, she told me and my siblings, she said, I didn't do a very good job teaching you how to live, but I want to do 
a good job of showing you how to die. So she planned, she took care of practical things. Most importantly, she showed her gratitude to her family by giving them the openings they needed to talk with her about the wrongs that she had done, to give them a chance to say what her family needed to say to her so that we, they, could let go of pain. Her good death was a gift to the family. That was a long goodbye. It was a two-year goodbye. So many times, though, we don't have the gift of time before a departure, nor can we always choose to say goodbye well. What then? Well, think back about the poem I read for the reading. Her goodbye is clearly not finished. If we never say goodbye effectively, we carry our emotions, even if we are numb to them, we carry our emotions with us into our next relationship, our next workplace, our next marriage, and so on. And these emotions can affect, even distort, how we see the world and how we interact with the world and we won't even know it. But it's not just our psychological wholeness that requires real goodbyes. Our spiritual wholeness requires it as well. For without re good goodbyes, not only will our human relationships suffer, but our relationship to God, to the universe, to the emptiness beneath everything, Whatever we call what is bigger than ourselves, that relationship will be distorted as well. And it'll need healing. Now, the goodbye that we say in the case of a sudden death, whether by illness or violence, is a long goodbye, but it's long on the back end after the fact of separation. The opportunity to do the tasks of a goodbye with another person has been snatched away. And there are lots of complicated feelings, often including guilt, anger, fear, as well as grief. And there can be trauma. So this kind of goodbye takes longer and is very challenging. I think, though, that the tasks are basically the same, even if they're harder. One, remember, is taking control of the situation, naming and making a plan. Two is getting your affairs in order. Three is letting go of grudges and hurt. And four is showing appreciation to those who've been important. Now, I'm going to share a story about my, after my sister's suicide, because when I look back on the process now, I didn't realize that I was doing these same four building blocks, but I was. In hindsight, I can see how they fit into what was going on with me. Um, she uh, committed suicide in 2006, and I was able to move slowly toward a level of closure and peace through these four blocks, although I didn't recognize it. Number one, I named and eventually took control of the situation but not for a while. I had to wander around in the wilderness of shock and depression for a time, I say, I don't know, a year, two years, two years. But after that, I made a simple plan. I asked for help. This led me to individual therapy and then participation in a suicide survivors group. And I started to move forward. Number two, getting my affairs in order. Again, it was eventually. And it wasn't legal or business matters so much as emotional matters, relationships that had been hurt. For one thing, I needed to spend more time with my family after months of solitude. And I needed to rebuild some long damaged relationships. The third step, letting go of grudges and pain this was the hardest step in my experience because not only was I angry with Chris because she had killed herself, I was angry with myself too for letting it happen 
And I also had unfinished business with her from my youth. Um, I was very fortunate. I was in divinity school at the time, and I found some really good tools to help me. One of them was a forgiveness process that um, a Robert, Dr. Robert Enright developed. And it's quite detailed, and it's an excellent process. Um, the thing to remember about forgiveness is forgiveness isn't saying that what someone did was right or OK. It's just the way the injured person can let go of anger and hurt. And since this process was really important for me in my healing, I want to share a little bit about it with you. The key pieces in the process were first getting deep and detailed clarity about what had actually happened and what were the many different consequences for you. Secondly, and these are all very broad brush strokes of, it's quite, um, as I said, a detailed process. This is very broad brush stroke. But the second part of the process was understanding what the emotional consequences would be of not choosing to forgive. <coughs> and that can be hard to own. Thirdly, we need to do the work of grieving. We need to do the work of the feelings that are there, even if we've numbed ourselves to them through drinking or overeating or overwork. We need to do the work of feeling those feelings. And, um, and then we also need to do the work of setting the, what the other person did, the offender did, in context. We need to understand their action and situation well enough to develop some amount of empathy for them. For me, the step involved understanding the impact of my sister's schizophrenia as I reflected on the wrong she had done so many years before. The final step of this forgiveness process is building our awareness that as we start to forgive, we're feeling better. We're feeling better. We're gaining something precious. So letting go of the hurts was the most difficult stage for me of saying goodbye to my sister, and that forgiveness process was very helpful. Back to the final stage um, that John Fletcher wrote about in saying goodbye, saying thank you. This can feel impossible to do um, with someone who has left in a violent or a sudden way. But we can work our way towards it. People handle this in very different ways and express themselves in different ways. Some people write letters to the person or letters to God or to someone you look up to. Other people write poetry or songs. Some people tape themselves speaking to their loved one. Other folks become active in a particular cause as a way of showing gratitude for that person's life. Personally, I spoke of my appreciation with my siblings. I wrote a poem. And I promised I would share Chris's story so that others could learn from it. Now, I've shared this process of what I went through after my sister's suicide in 2006. Now I invite you to do a little work. I invite you now to think of a significant goodbye that you faced. It could be something in the past. It could be something right here now. It could be something that you know is coming up. <coughs> Name it. And now, ask yourself, what can I do to take control of the situation to the extent that I can? Can I make even a simple plan And if so, what? And then I ask you to think about what are some of the practical tasks you will need to address 
to adapt to this new situation. And then, what are the hurts or pains or grudges that you're going to need to let go of? And how might you do that? And finally, what can you do to show appreciation or to acknowledge the gratitude that you feel? This is hard work. I invite you now to put that aside and go back to it when you have the time and you want to do it. But let's end with a little bit of practice for our good goodbyes, something that's easier. Let's practice appreciating the gifts that someone has brought us. It's good to have rituals for these things, so I'll ask you to use your words and a handshake. I want you right now to think about one of the people that's sitting close to you and think about what you are sincerely grateful for about them. Maybe they smiled at you when you walked in or sat down. Maybe they remind you of somebody you love. Um, or maybe just the fact that they're here in worship with you, being present with you. So I want you to pick somebody and think what you're going to thank them for. Now, turn to your neighbor and thank them, telling them why. Look them in the eye, meet them, make that connection, and shake their hand. <laughs> Chandra, I'm so glad you come here. You add life to our community so much. Okay, I just want to say thank you, okay? Thank you. Beverly, thank you for all of the work that you do on the comm, too, by the way. Thank you for doing that kind of thing for the church. I really appreciate it, and bringing Blair. Bringing Blair. Thank you. I'm so glad you're. So as I said at the beginning of this um, sermon, you and I will also be saying goodbye um, over the next few months, and um, I hope it has as much joy in it as what I just heard here in the sanctuary. Um, as John Hughes said in your quote that's on the order of service, saying hello and goodbye are the two major learning tasks all human beings need to accomplish. He's right. So let's keep practicing. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.